everyone, and welcome to another episode of Standing Eight. I'm Paul Fitzgerald, and I'm joined by my co-host, three-time world champion and boxing hall of famer Jeff Finnick. Great to be here, Michael. Really excited today. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Paul. I'm really excited uh, to be speaking to Michael today, and um, yeah, can't wait. I just watched his podcast he done with uh, with Mike Tyson. I'm really excited, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got a very special guest here today in uh, Michael Francis, a former captain of the Colombo crime family. Welcome. Well, good to be here, guys. So, Michael, you're, you've got a you've got a, a really rich history, obviously, in in the American mafia. Your father was the underboss of the Colombo crime family. What was that like growing up, um, having a father who was an underboss of of a family? Well, it's certainly different. You know, it's it's not only that he was the, the underboss, but he was extremely high profile. You know, he was a major target of law enforcement. He was. Um, you know, a media darling at the time that just loved covering him. He was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. So, you know, I grew up uh, with law enforcement around us all the time. My dad being arrested quite a bit. Um, I grew up hating law enforcement as a result because my dad was my hero. You know, I idolized him. I loved him. He was a great father. And so I kind of grew up with that, you know, that distorted sense of view, I guess, in a way. Um, and it was different, you know, just, just a lot different. Yeah, definitely. How did you how did you get involved in organized crime? You're a college, you're a pre-med student. How do you go from you know such an academic sort of background and then getting involved in organized crime? Well, you know, during the whole, you know, decade, 1960s, my dad was indicted and uh, went to trial three times. Uh twice, uh, actually four times, I'm sorry, twice for some very serious crimes, once for murder. He was acquitted in all those cases, but then he got um Indicted, went to trial, got convicted for uh, masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies, and he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. And he went off to do his time in 1970. I was a pre-med student at that time at uh, university in Long Island. And my dad, you know, he said, Mike, I'm innocent. I'm not a bank robber. I didn't commit these crimes. And, um, you know, we got to do what I got to do to prove my innocence. And you know, I got very close to Joe Colombo at that time, and I started, you know, to be influenced a lot by my dad's friends. And I said, I'm not going to school. If I don't help my father out, he's going to die in prison. And, you know, so that's that's kind of what happened. You know, I, I just wanted to help him. And I, I visited him in a penitentiary, and I told him, I'm not going to school anymore. You know, we need money. We got to turn these witnesses. You know, we got to defend your case. And he said, well, if you're going to be on the street, then I want you on the street the right way. And his mind, the right way was to become a member of his life. So he proposed me for membership when I was about 21, 22 years old. Was that scary, Michael? You know, not really. I, I guess, you know, Jeff, because I grew up with my dad and, you know, I wasn't afraid of the police. You know, there was a very large uh, law enforcement presence around us from the time I was a kid. I got into run-ins with them. I didn't like them. So... You know, I mean, I, I really, you know, it was kind of getting even with them, you know, to be part of that life. So it wasn't, it wasn't scary at that point for me. It was just, this is something natural that I should be doing. And when did you become a made member of, of that life? Well, I was a recruit for, uh, you know, just a little over two years. And then uh, I was 24 years old, 1975, um, October 31st, you know, Halloween over here when, you um, you know, I went through the whole ceremony and, and took the oath and became a made member. So I was 24 years old when that happened. And what was that like? What was that whole process like, the ceremony? You know, what are the sort of feelings that you felt at that particular time? Yeah, it was very intense. You know, it was a dimly lit room late at night. There were six of us that, uh, you know, took the oath that night. We went into a room individually and uh, the boss was seated at the head of like a horseshoe configuration, the underboss consigliere to his left and right. And then all the captains were alongside of them. We had about 15 in our family at that point. And, you know, I stood in front of the boss and uh, he took a knife, cut my finger, some blood dropped on the floor. This is a blood oath. I cupped my hands. He took a picture of a saint. It was a Catholic altar card, put it on my hands, lit it aflame. It didn't hurt. It was merely symbolic. It burned quickly. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you're born again into a new life into Cousin Ostra. Uh, violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers, you'll die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. And he said, do you accept? And I said, yes, I do. And, you know, um, it was a very exhilarating feeling for me. You know, I had, I had been in a recruit for two years, had to prove myself worthy. And, you know, for me, it was a big deal. I mean, I was becoming, you know, bonded with my dad in another way. 
I was going to be able to help him out. Um, I had a very idealistic view of the life at that point, so it was it mattered a lot to me at that point. Did it make you feel invincible, Michael? You know, it, it, it made me feel strong, you know, because they tell you, look, you know, uh, you're part of a brotherhood now. Nobody will ever bother your mother, your wife, your sister, your daughter. Wherever you go around the world, you'll have somebody to back you up. Um, you know, you got brothers now. And, you know, there's nothing stronger as far as I'm concerned than this brotherhood of men. You know, I got your back, you got mine. And it, it was a great feeling. So I don't know so much invincible, but it certainly made me feel, you know, strong. Made you feel important. But, uh, Michael, I know you're saying this about this brotherhood and all this, and I grew up in a, you know, not, not as tough as that, but I grew up in a in a region where I got locked up when I was a young boy. And like I said, my, my house has been shot and I've uh, been in the street and attacked by a group of guys I've been bottled and put in hospital, just, you know, and sting up on myself. But um, were you ever worried? Were you, like, even though you're supposed to have this brotherhood and all these people around that can look after you? Were you ever, like, really scared or concerned that something might happen to you or your family? Well, you, you do worry, not so much for my family, but, you know, look, that's a life, honestly, you know, um, there's a lot of treachery in that life, you know. When you, when you rise in the ranks and you become, um, you know, your own guy, so to speak, you know, people are watching you all the time, you know, it's, if it's not the government, it's your own people, so you got to watch your back. You know, you got to be very careful. You got to know how to navigate that life. And if you don't, you know, there's serious consequences if you put into a position where, you know, somebody's trying to trap you into something or so. I was always very mindful of that, but I was very fortunate because my dad, uh, you know, he knew that life as well or better than anybody. So he coached me, he advised me. And then what I picked up on my own, you know, helped me to navigate that life. Because look, I saw a lot of guys get killed, you know, honestly, um, you know, friends of mine, people that made mistakes, people I think died for the wrong reasons. Um, but I got to understand that life, you know, pretty well. So I, I watched myself. Michael, did you, su did you surprise yourself or your father in how successful you were and how smart you were at being an entrepreneur and making the, the millions and millions of dollars that you made for, for the mob? Well, my father was excited about it. You know, he, uh, I, I guess he knew I had something in me, but we didn't know. I didn't even know what it was. You know, I mean, you know, I, I was fortunate in that I knew how to use the life to benefit me in business. And I was very aggressive. Um, you know, I guess I had an entrepreneurial mind where I just thought of new things to do. And I, I brought some new things into the family that hadn't been done before. And, uh, you know, just got fortunate, went on to make a lot of money. And in that life, you know, money is power if you, if you present yourself the right way. So it worked for me. Michael, you're one of the, the highest money makers in the mafia. I think it's, it's been quoted as saying you're making on average $8 million, $8 million a week in the 80s through the gasoline um, scheme that you devised. What made you such a good earner and how do you come across these different opportunities that sort of presented themselves to you? Well, you know, that's the thing, you know, th there's a fallacy out there that, you know, mob guys sit in their social clubs and they concoct all these brilliant ideas to, you know, to get involved in various business schemes. Normally, it's not that way. Normally, somebody from a company, a business, Wall Street, major company, they think of a way to maybe defraud their company, make a little extra money, and they come to us. And, you know, that happens quite a bit. And, you know, I think if I had a talent, my talent was to be able to recognize a good deal and then follow through with it. And uh, that's how it happened in the gas business. Somebody had a small gasoline operation, you know, he had a small company, he owned a couple of gas stations, and some guys from another family were extorting him. They were shaking him down. They wanted to become his partner. So he ran to me for help. And, um, you know, he said, Mike, I got a germ of an idea, you know, where maybe we can, you know, steal some tax money. I didn't like the government, so that was kind of music to my ears. Okay, you know, tell me what you got in mind. So I, I was able to back those other guys off, and, and I went into business with this guy. And, um, you know, the first take we had, uh, I'll never forget, we had uh, first two weeks we were in business, um, my end was $320,000. So I, I took that germ of an idea, and we built it into – uh, where we were selling, we had 350 gas stations we either owned or operated. I had 18 companies that were licensed to collect the tax on gasoline. And at the height of my operation, which I ran for eight years, we were selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month, and we were taking down 30 to 40 cents a gallon. So if you do the math, it was a lot of money. 
And, um, you know, I brought in the Russians from Brooklyn that were my partners. They had a small operation. I combined them into ours and, you know, we grew because of that. And, um, you know, in some ways I got lucky, you know, this guy came to me and we were able to develop this. Um, but it was a very, it was a very intricate operation. We had to be really careful because law enforcement was on to us the mm. whole time. They just couldn't figure it out. So I always had to stay one step ahead of them. And that was, uh, was not easy because, you know, they're not totally stupid. You know, they know, <laughs> they know what they're doing sometimes. Yeah. So, um, it, it was quite a, you know, it was a sophisticated operation that we put together. And Michael, how was the money split? How did you share this money? <laughs> well, you know, it was a big operation. I mean, look, I didn't put $8 million a week in my pocket. <laughs> I don't want you to understand that, you know. And, I mean, I was kicking up $2 million a week to the family. They were earning big with me. Um, and then, you know, but look, I'm not complaining. I did pretty well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, I took my end. But a lot of guys earned a lot of money, you know. And that's one of the secrets on the street. You know, when guys are earning with you, you're in pretty good shape. You know, if you're a greedy guy out there and you're taking it all, um, that doesn't work well in that life. You know, a lot of people paid the price for doing that, even even on a high level. But um, I made a lot of people earn and uh, they did well with me. And uh, just it, it was good, you know, until the government caught up with me. Was there a lot of jealousy around at that particular time from other families because you're earning so much money and, you know, it's, it's within your, your particular crew and family? Was there a lot of jealousy and sort of treachery around that? Oh, yeah. You know, you have to deal with that, especially that I was one of the younger guys and you have resentment automatically because you're a young guy. You know, when you come into that life, as soon as you take that oath, you're on equal standing with everybody. I don't care if they were there 30 years before you. They're your equal at that point. And, uh, you know, the, the old timers resented that. You yeah, know, a lot of times I had to sit down with the old timers over different things. And because I was so much younger then, they resented it. But, you know, you got to hold your own anyway. And uh, so I had I had to deal with that, but I also made a lot of people earn money, you know. So they they, they liked that fact, you know. Um, you know, like Fat Tony who was a boss of the Genovese family, very close with me, and uh, you know I, I made him earn money with me too. So you you make a lot of friends. You just gotta like I said, it's a it's a line you gotta navigate. Mm. There would have been a lot of a lot of those guys that they're thinking that you got a leg up because of your father, of course. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, my father had a lot of respect. And, you know, I, I tried my best to to kind of hold, you know, hold my own in that regard and, and make him proud and let people think the same of me, you know. So um, it, it, it worked well. Look, you know, the only reason the whole gas business came tumbling down was because my partner became an informant and uh, he got in trouble on an unrelated case and uh, didn't want to go to jail. So he gave me up and he gave up the operation. Um, but other than that, you know, the government they took a lot of shots at me. I, 18 times I was arrested. I went to trial five times. I beat every case. I beat Giuliani on a big case. So, you know, I was well prepared and well financed to defend myself in that regard. But eventually they're going to get you, you know, mm. that it's not going to last no matter who you are, how, how much money you have, how strong you are, you're going down at some point. And hey Michael, it's a, it's a strange thing. Like I said, I grew up obviously um, doing a lot of things wrong and, but it's um, that oath that we all take and the promise that we all give that we're, you know, never going to give anybody up or we're going to be law. It's, it, really, at, at the end of the day, the thing that I learned about life, the ones that that lasted the longest were the ones who were the ones who give people up, who, who, who you know, betrayed each other. Well, you know, unfortunately, in, in some cases that's true, you know, and, and there was a lot of that in, in my former life. You know, when that racketeering law came into effect really in the 80s and guys were getting bundles of time and, you know, no bail, um, that's when guys started to flip. And, you know, what happened in the racketeering law, which was devastating to our life, is that murder prior to the racketeering laws, uh, you know, coming into play, Murder was a state crime. It wasn't a federal crime. But under the RICO statute, you can be indict people for murder. So that's how they use that tool so effectively to go after guys that allegedly, you know, um, ordered the murders, you know, the bosses and all of that. And, um, you know, when guys can go down for murder and get life for 100 years, they don't stand up that easy, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of what anybody says. When you're facing that kind of time, look, any mob guy can do 10 years, 15 years. You know, you get out on parole after seven, eight, you know, and you go on with your life. But when you're facing uh, life without parole or 100 years in prison, no parole, 
it's a whole different ball game, and mm. we saw it happen in our life. I mean, guys started flipping left and right. What's the state? What's what's your view on the current state of the mafia in America? Is it still around? Is it what's where's that at? You know, it's still around. I mean, it's not going to go away in my lifetime, but uh, you know, it's not anywhere near what it was through the golden years. And the golden years of the mob mafia in the United States really were. Uh, from the late 40s, early 50s, right through the mid 80s. That's when we had so much control over the unions. We had, you know, strong political connections. We were in Wall Street. We were in corporate America. We were everywhere. Mm. And, um, you know, that's changed now because, again, when that RICO statute came in, they stripped us of so much power. They put so many guys away. Uh, They made it very hard to operate. So, it exists now, but it's kind of very low key, and they don't wield the kind of power that they did during my day. Mm. I seen in your interview with you were doing with Mike Tyson uh, on Mike Tyson's podcast, saying how one of the mob guys who had murdered nineteen people got a got a plea deal to, to you know and and you know yeah how crazy is that? Sammy the Bull. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, look, they were given deals. You know the. If they want Gotti, they're going to give somebody a great deal to get him, you know, and, and the government has the power to do that, whether it's right or wrong. Um, you know, it depends on which side you're on. <laughs> but a lot of guys got, you know, sweet deals for cooperating and testifying against other people. Now, that and, doesn't uh, matter what side you're on. That's wrong. Um, somebody's murdered somebody 19 times mm. and you can get a deal. That's, that's crazy. That's, yeah, that is crazy. Well, Michael, did you, know, did you know John Gotti and what are your sort of thoughts on – on John as a yeah, as I knew John pretty well. Um, you know, I had uh, socially, I had a you know good time with him. You know, he was he was fun to be around. Business wise, he was very difficult. You know, he had a tremendous ego. He was very narcissistic in that way. And I had two run-ins with him business wise, and it was a nightmare to deal with him. Uh, but other than that, you know, I got along. I mean, we weren't. I, I can't say we were the best of friends, but when we were out socially, we had a drink together. We left. You know. Was that kind of thing, and uh, on a business level, I, I'd rather not be doing business with him. Let's put it that way. Yeah, got it, got it. Um, John Gotti was obviously famously involved in the in the murder of Paul Castellana outside of Spark Steakhouse there in New York. How did that change the whole mob scene? And what are your thoughts on on that particular event? Well, it wasn't a popular thing that John did. I mean, he, uh, you know, the other bosses were not happy about it. I mean, Chin Giganti actually you know, was looking to kill Gotti as a result. Uh, my boss, Persico, uh, he didn't like Gotti. You know, nobody likes, w- when you go off like that, you don't get commissioned okay and you kill a boss, people resent it, you know, mm-hmm. they don't like it. So he didn't He didn't make many friends as a result of that. Um, but, you know, I don't, as far as having an impact on, you know, the life itself, other than the fact that he brought so much heat on his own family, you know, on the Gambino family. And a lot of guys resented that also. Mm. So, you know, John was a very flashy guy. And, uh, you know, in that life, you're supposed to be low key. I mean, I was I was kind of uh, guilty myself, not of trying to be flashy, but I just, you know, I had a jet plane, I had a helicopter. I, I enjoyed the fruits of my labor, so to speak. So that's not the best thing in the world when, you, when you're doing stuff like that. So it doesn't help. So, I mean, John had a lot of resentment. You know, I, I would say that. Yeah, got it. Got it. Um, you would have been involved in a lot of sit-downs in your time and obviously you're a younger guy, hugely successful, captain in the Columbos. Was there ever a time where you thought, wow, this, this sit-down's not going very well, it's, it's not going my way, I'm, I'm concerned for my safety, what's, what's going to come out of this? Was there a particular event that, that sort of well, stands out? You know, I sat down so many times in different business events, so I never, I never worried, you know, about my own welfare in a sit down. Um, you know, I knew I usually went in pretty well prepared. I didn't like to lose, so um, you know, if I knew I couldn't win, then I knew what I would settle for, and for me, that was a win. You know, so you, you know, a lot of politics have played, you know, with these things. So you had to be careful. But there was, you know, one of the horrors of that night, of that life, is that you can make a mistake. You know, uh, your best friend walks you into a room and you don't walk out again. You know, mm. that's that's one of the horrors of that life. And I had that experience one night when they were trying to shake me down. Basically, you know, the, the word out on the street was that I was making billions, which wasn't true. And I'm turning in millions. So now they want to make sure, you know, that because money is, is, is very meaningful in that life. 
So I had, you know, a night when I was brought into a room that I'll be honest with you, I was pretty scared because my best friend walked me in. I didn't like the setup and uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. I had to walk into a basement apartment to meet the boss who was on parole. So it had to be a covert meeting. And uh, I was scared. You know, did you have to walk in? Did you have to go? Well, yeah. I mean, if I didn't go, uh, number one, it, it wouldn't look good. Number two. Uh, where am I going to go? Where am I going to run? You know, and people have asked me, you know, I got to thought you were going to get ambushed. Why would you go? You know, Jeff, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that. Cause I've been asked that all the time. It was about a, uh, we went to a house in Brooklyn it was late at night and we parked the car and my best friend was one of my best friends. I should say he was another captain in the family. He got out of the car. I was on the, the passenger side and he walked behind me and there was another guy sitting in the back of the car. And I, I didn't know him that well. I mean, I recognize him. I might have seen him once or twice, but I'm saying, man, you know, what did I need this guy in the car for? So now uh, it was about a 30 yard walk from the car down to the basement apartment. And people have said to me, I was scared. You know, I'll be honest with you. I was, I was scared. My heart was beating. I said, this, this is not good. I'm, I may get killed here. And uh, people said, well, why didn't you cut and run? And, you know, that was really heroic. It, it wasn't heroic at all. It was kind of robotic. I mean, I said, I was so much a product of the life. I said, hey, if this is it, then I guess this is it. And maybe out of fear, I didn't. Run. I don't know. I, I can't respond to that. I can't think about, you know, what caused me to keep going. But when that door opened up, uh, you know, I almost had a heart attack because, you know, I know how it goes. You know, that door opens, somebody's there, you're dead. That's it. It's gone. But fortunately, that didn't happen. I'm here. And, you know, they grilled me on stuff. And what, what happened in that meeting, I started to get mad. And you don't do that with your boss. You know, that's that's never going to turn out good. I started to get angry because I'm saying, hey, I'm turning in all this money and you guys give me this kind of hard time. Question I didn't put anybody in trouble. I didn't, you know, I took all the heat. I took all the weight. Uh, but then I calmed myself down and everything was good. And at the end of the night, oh, you know, they hug you and, you know, have a glass of wine and that's it, you know. But, hey, that's the life. That's You sign up for it. That's part of it, man. And do you, do you miss the life these days? You know, I miss certain things about it. Yeah, I mean, I miss the camaraderie with my guys. You know, I had a big crew. We were, we were pretty solid, you know, so I, I miss that. I mean, I don't miss the partying. I settle down now. You know, I'm married for a long time, so I don't miss the partying or any of that. But, you know, I, I do miss that camaraderie among the guys. You know, I really do. It was something special that we had, even for the time that we had it. And, um, you know, I, I, and it was, look, I had some good times, you know. I mean, I lived pretty large back then. We yeah, had good Michael, times. And even when you think of it today, when it wasn't what you really thought it was, like I'm, I'm the same, like I was in these gangs and stuff and, uh, I loved. I used to. I used to have a saying that you know, how do men say their wife is their best friend? I've learned through the years now that without doubt my wife's my best friend because all those guys who I thought were my loyal um, friends and stuff weren't the loyal guys I thought they were. So you know, but it, life just changes, and I think you learn, you get wiser. And I'm the same. You've been married for a long time now, and it's the best thing I've ever done. You know. Sure. I mean, you know, look. You know, when you get older and you mature, you realize there's different things in life that uh, that are satisfying and, and give you contentment. So, look, you know, I, I say it, that, that life is a dead end street and, um, you, you know, you're just not going to last. And it's a message that I give to young people all over the world. Uh, you, you're just not going to last. It's a different world today. There's too many informants out there. The government here in the United States has too many weapons, uh, you know, and they're going to catch up with you. And when they do, you know, here in the States, I mean, you know, there's severe consequences for being part of that life. Very severe. I mean, I have guy friends of mine that got 300 years, mm. two life sentences, 100 years with no parole. You got to do 85% here. So you, you don't have a shot. You're done. Yeah. Crazy. I'm sure you get asked this question all the time, but how were you able to walk away from the mob life and do what you do now? You know, you didn't inform on anybody. Um, how did that come about and how, how were you able to walk away when so many other people weren't? Well, you know, it was a combination of things, I think, you know, um, you know, I, I mean, obviously I got very fortunate, but, you know, um, I knew that when I left the life, there's no way I could go back to New York. I wouldn't last because you're not allowed to walk away. So 
there's no blueprint, you know, that there's a blueprint for walking away from that life successfully. You know, I mean, I didn't enter a witness protection program. I'll be honest with you. I spoke to the government because I was trying to, hey, I'm done with the life. You know, leave me alone. This is the crimes I committed. I took a plea. I got a 10 year sentence. I paid them $15 million in restitution. I gave up a ton of property that I had to settle my stuff with the government because I wanted them off my back. And um, so I don't go back to New York. You know, I know that life intimately well. I know that they're never going to walk me into a room. They're going to have to work to come and get me now. Mm. So what do I do? I change my whole lifestyle. I don't walk my dog at seven o'clock in the morning, create a pattern in my life. I don't go to the same restaurant every Tuesday night. Wow. I stay out of nightclubs. I know that's a bad place for me. People recognize, you know, who hangs out there, you know, so I changed my whole lifestyle in, in a way. And I was very disciplined with respect to that because I never sold these other guys short. Never sold them short. I knew how capable they were. And, you know, one by one, every one of them went to jail or got killed. Every one of them. We had a big war in our family in the early 90s. I mean, 13 guys got killed. I think 30 guys became informants. Another 60 or 70 went to jail. I mean, it was devastating for the Columbos. So, you know, and, and after a while, when they realized, you know, when I walked away, everybody really thought, oh, he's going to be, become an informant. He's going to testify. And so people were really upset with me, even my father thought. And I kept sending them messages. I said, Dad, I'm not going to hurt anybody. You're not going to understand what I'm doing, but I'm not going to hurt anybody. And, um, you know, eventually the government did me bad. They were putting my name on the witness list of trials that were going on in New York, like I was going to be a witness. So when, when the uh, guys got the discovery, they saw my name on the list. But then I never appeared mm. anywhere. And then, you know, I'm out, I do five years, and then they violate my parole because the government was upset with me. I go back to prison. So now people are saying, this guy's not cooperating. He went back to prison. He never hurt anybody. So now the heat, you know, kind of in a way came off of me. They had their own problems. I'm out in California. Hey, leave this guy alone, you know? Yeah. And then my boss, who really took it personal, he really took it personal when I walked away. He got life in prison. You know, so he, he was powerless to come after me. Had he been on the street, I would have had a problem because mm. he was a treacherous guy. And uh, even though we got along very well, he would have not let me go. Um, but he, he lost everything that he had. He's dead now. He died a year ago. It's crazy this story you're telling me as a, a friend who's a, a mobster here in Australia, a great friend of mine named Graham Abbo Henry. And he kind of tells the same story how – he wouldn't go to the same place or be doing anything at the same time any day because he knew some of these guys are watching him. They tried to they tried to execute him a couple of times and they failed because he was just one step ahead of them. But it was just so similar listening to you and listening to Graham. Yeah, yeah so fine. so similar. Yeah. yeah, you know, I had uh, you know I don't know how serious the attempts were, but I had you know the FBI uh, when they get word from their informants that your life is in danger, they have to tell you whether they like it or not. So I mean, I got. I came home one day when I was on parole and two agents were in the, in my house with my wife. She was crying because they told her that, you know, there's people in town to kill me. And if I don't leave, I'll be dead by the weekend. So I had to pack up my family. You know, we had to go away for a couple of days. And um, so, I mean, I had a couple of things like that, but you know, um, like I said, I, I just got very fortunate with the way things broke for me, you know? And now look, I don't go back to New York and say, hey, guys, you know, I'm coming back to visit everybody. I, w I probably wouldn't last, you know, yeah. they, I wouldn't last 48 hours. They'd get me, yeah. uh, you know, you're not allowed to do what I did. But but uh, I just been, you know, just just very fortunate. You know, it's funny. It took me. Uh, I always had a problem getting a visa to go to Australia, you know. And so after I finally get my visa, it took me months, you know, to get it. We had a, I had to do all sorts of things. When I get into town, I think it was Melbourne, it might have been Sydney, uh, I get an invitation from, I forget his name, from a very well-connected guy. Michael, we have dinner for you. Come on to the restaurant. You know, let's let's get together a little bit. It was a very nice invitation. So I said word back. I said, hey, you know how I had a struggle to get here? I said, all they have to do is see me at your restaurant. I said, they'll ship me out, you know, within an hour, I'll be gone. So I said, but I appreciate it very much. You know, <laughs> I forget his name, but I heard he was... Uh, you know, he was a pretty well respected guy. <laughs> well, I don't want to. I don't want to bring up any names at the moment either. But yeah, but no, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I would have loved to. Yeah, when you when you're here next, I'd love to catch up with you.
No, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And we'd love to talk about Mike, Cam, because like I said, I know you've done a few things with Mike Tyson and we can just change the angle a little bit here, but what do you think of Mike? You know, uh, I really got to like Mike. You know, he's so Smart transparent. Man. He, he's so real, you know, and that's what I said to him. I said, Mike, you know, you're so genuine, so transparent. I said, you know, you, you, you became a role model just for your transparency and the fact that, you know, you, you're, you're as humble as you are. Yeah. And it's genuine. You know that. Oh, you know, I'm not and for somebody who can honest. change your life around from where he's been, I, uh, Michael, I've, I've been with him when, wow, I've, I've, a couple of times I've been uh, in Vegas and I, I, I would leave the room crying. I thought that he was going to be dead, you know. He, he was, you know, ruined. And, you know, I love him. He's my, he's my brother and, you know, like I said, and um, to see what he's done now and to change his life around and to be such a, an amazing role model, oh, I'm so, so proud of him. And like I said, I watched your um, your podcast with him on uh, Hot Boxing and you're doing another one soon? Yeah, he's going to actually sit down with me on Monday and uh, him and Tom Patty and we're going to have a sit down and then that'll air on my YouTube channel. Wow. Well, Tom was my co-trainer when I was looking after Mike. Tom Petty's a, an amazing man, one of my great friends here. Yeah, I think you'll have a great time with both of them. Yeah. Well, we, we had the pleasure about uh, two, three months ago, we, we went to dinner together, all of us. And my wife was there and Mike's wife and uh, Tom and, and another gentleman, I forget his name, um, that, that I think was working with the training too with Mike. And we just had a great time. You know, it was the second or third time I was in Mike's presence and uh, just enjoyed it every single time. All of them. They're all great guys. We had a really good time together. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh, just spending some time. I said, Mike, uh, you're from Brooklyn. You know good pizza, yeah. but you're going to taste really good pizza this time. Now, listen. <laughs> so he's excited about that. This um, Always the mob's been involved in around the boxing arenas. So yeah, oh, yeah. in, in your time, were you, were you around the boxing? Oh, all the time. I loved the fights. My dad loved the fights. Uh, you know, I had a little interest in Vito Antifermo. Oh, yes, Vito? of course. He fought yeah. Hagler, yep. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. fought Hagler. He was yeah. a great guy. Um, you know, and I, I, I never missed a fight way back when. I loved the game. Loved it. So but who was your favorite I fighter? Watching. I mean, I love watching him. Oh, everybody. Who was your favorite fighter? Don't you say know, Jeff I, uh, I love Joe Frazier. <laughs> For some reason, I love smoking Joe, uh -huh. and I, I really got to like Ali. You know, after the after the um, oh gosh, uh, the fight. What's his name? George uh, Foreman. Yeah, after the Foreman yeah. fight, I, I just gained so much respect for him. You know, and just uh, I don't know. I mean, but you know, I, I liked a bunch of the heavyweights and you know middleweights. I liked. I mean, I love Sugar Ray. Yeah, amazing. you know, yeah, he was a warrior. I think me, me and Mike uh, both share the same. We love Roberto Duran. Yeah, Duran, I loved to yeah. Listen, you had to love yeah. him too. Yeah, I did, I did some work with Roberto for a few years as well. It was an amazing man. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, look, when you see a warrior like that in the ring, you, you got to love him and respect him. There's no doubt. And then when you see Mike outside the ring, like I said, um, as hard and tough as he was, he's, he's a softie outside there. He loves everybody. He helps so many people. People don't realise what a great human he is outside the boxing ring as well. So, yeah, I love Mike and I'm so happy to to see you've connected with him and Tom because they're great people. You know, yeah, it was funny. Um, I, I have uh, my wife's cousin is a UFC guy and uh, his name is uh, Anthony Pettis. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever heard of him. Yes, I do. Yeah. I yeah. And so I was uh, talking to Mike about it, and uh, I said, Mike, do you like UFC? You know, you like the fight, fighting like that? And he says, Mike, if two cockroaches were fighting on the table, I'd be interested in it. And he said, I love everything that's a fight. <laughs> you know, I cracked up. He made me laugh, you know. But, uh, yeah, he's just, again, you know, as you know, just so genuine and it's a pleasure to be around him. Michael, while we're on sports just quickly, I mean, the, the mafia and the mob were famous for fixing – college football games and basketball games and, you know, sports. How did that come about and how do you, how do you go about fixing a college football game or a basketball game or, or something like that? Well, listen, you know, it's all about the spread. It's not about winning or losing. It's about the point spread. So, you know, a lot of these athletes got themselves in trouble in gambling situation. And, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, I had a number of bookmakers working for me back in the 80s. And uh, we had a lot of athletes gambling with us because, you know, they love to gamble. Let's, let's, uh, let's face it. It kind of raises the, the stakes in the competition. And so many of them are not good gamblers for whatever reason. They gamble emotionally or whatever. But, you know, I would have a bookmaker come to me and say, hey, you know, so-and-so from the, the Jets or the Giants or whatever, he's into me for 50 grand. Should I cut him off? And I said, why would you cut him off? All you're doing is writing an entry on a piece of paper. 
I said, let him get into you for a quarter of a million bucks and then bring him to me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that would happen, you know, they'd come to me and I'd say, Hey, you know, what happened? You owe me some money here, you know, 250 grand. How are you going to pay? And, you know, back then they didn't earn the kind of money that, you know, that they're earning today. And that's a lot of money. And even more than that. And I'd say, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'm a big fan of yours. I love the way you play. I said, you don't have to pay me uh, now. Just, just pay me five points a week. Every Monday after your game, you come here and you bring me the cash. Five points a week. Now, you know darn well, okay, that he'll say anything to get out of the room. Yeah. And then he's going across town to bet with another bookmaker. And before you know it, he's in a hole for a lot of money. Five, six, seven weeks later, he comes back. He can't pay the juice anymore. And I said, okay, but don't worry about it. I'm going to give you another shot. You're the quarterback. First three times you get the ball, you put it in the hand of the other receiver. I know what the point spread is. You're going to help me. And maybe not in one game, but in two, three, four games, I'm going to get my money back and make some. And that's how it is. You know, you get these guys to bid with a little bit. You know, you got a, 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 a running back. First time you get that, three times you put, you put that ball on the ground. That's where I want it. You know, football is fairly easy. Basketball even easier. You got one guy in a basketball team or you got a ref, you got it made. Because, you know, a ref, you got a ref, he can call a foul every single time they go down the court or he can miss the foul if he wants to, you mm -hmm. know. And those those little misses or hits make the difference in the spread. You know, you got Kobe Bryant playing and the uh, Lakers are favored to win by 10. You keep Kobe on the bench for an extra three, four, five minutes. That manipulates the spread. So there's a lot of ways to do it. And it's very unfortunate. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not proud of it. But that's how it happens. You know, these guys, you don't have to break their legs or do anything like that. You know, you just get them to do your bidding, put them in trouble, and then they got to work for you. Yeah, got it. Was there ever a case that you had to break some legs? Well, I didn't, no. You know, I, <laughs> you know, I, I was kind of smooth that way. You know, you know, I, I tell you, I owned a bunch of clubs that I had an interest in when I was, you know, on the street. And I used to tell my bouncers, I used to get these big, strong bouncers, right? And I used to say, you see, look in the mirror. See how big and strong you are? If you need to use that, then you ain't worth a dime. If your presence alone doesn't make people stay in shape, because I don't want people fighting in my club, and I don't want you beating everybody up, and I don't want to get a lawsuit. I want, I want your presence. you got to know how to handle it. And the first time you don't, you're out. And, you know, and, and it worked, you know, most of the time. I mean, look, every once in a while, somebody gets out of hand. But for the most part, your presence should be enough. You know, I had situations where people knew who I was when I walked into the room. I didn't have to threaten you. You know, it was it was known that, look, when I say something to you, I mean it. Mm. Don't let me have to say it again. You know who I am. Enough said. Respect. And, you know, most of the time that will work. Every once in a while, you know, it's a little bit different. But most of the time that will work if you know how to carry yourself. Yeah, got it. Got it. And what's, what's an average day in the life like? What's an average day? What was it like for you? Well, for me, you know, I was a pretty aggressive guy, so I, I had a lot going on. You know, I'd get up. I was uh, always an early riser, even till today, you know, three, four hours sleep, I'm good. And I'd start my day early, you know, get through all my activities. I, I'd always go home for dinner. You know, most of the time, I should say, I have dinner with my wife and children. And then 9, 10, 11 o'clock, I'm out again, you know, with the guys. And we'd go clubbing and stay out till 2, 3 in the morning, get back home and you know, we did business late at night also, you know, meetings and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but, you know, I had to separate my mob business and my legitimate business because um, a lot of times I had to report downtown to Brooklyn, you know, to meet with my guys, to meet with my superiors at the time. And then I had, you know, I had two automobile agencies. I had a big film company out in California. I had, a, I had you know, a major gas operation in Florida and here in New York, but there in New York rather. So I was always busy, always. Yeah, got it. Got it. Did you train, Michael? Did you look after yourself? Did you do any, any, any training for yourself? You know, I always stayed in shape. You know, I never gained weight. You know, I always ate right. Uh, I played a lot of racquetball. You know, I'm a, I'm a sports guy. Yeah. I like, like sports. Played a lot of racquetball. Um, in prison, I played softball when I was on the yard. I did a lot. You know, I golf now. You know, play racquetball now with my two boys. So I always stayed in shape. I didn't really work out and train. I wish I would have, but it's something that I, I just have trouble getting into. I don't know why. You know, it's, it's, it's a mental thing. I mean, you know, my wife likes to run. I think running is the most boring thing in the world. You know, I just can't get into it. But well, your birthday, I wish I could, honestly. Yeah. I, I wish I could. And she's, my wife's, you know, almost demanding that I, I do it. Because my, my two daughters are personal trainers. 
My wife is a workout freak her entire life. You know, my other my other daughter is they're, they're all in tremendous shape, mm. all of them. We my can, both boys are great athletes, you know, so. Michael, we can celebrate our birthday on the same day because mine's on the 28th of May, yours is the 27th of May. Oh, yeah. So it's the, that if I come over to America, it's the same day, so we can maybe celebrate oh, one day. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a date. Yeah, no doubt. I'll tell you're a good Gemini. Yeah, and it's usually um, here in the States, uh, our birthdays are normally on a holiday weekend, Memorial Day weekend. So it's always a good time. We get a, we get an extra day to celebrate. There you Marty. go. We'll have to do some training with Jeff when you come down to Australia and visit us. You know what? It's funny. When I was in prison on the yard, in the yard, I had a, a good friend of mine. His name is Lance. We're still good friends. He's out now. And when I trained with him in prison, I was in the best shape when I was on the yard in prison. You know, they're always locking me down and all that. But when I had about a, I had about an eight month straight run where I was out in the yard and we worked out three, four days a week and I was in great shape then, really. I really got into it. My body responded well, you know. I never took any stuff, you know, anything like that. We couldn't get it in there, but uh, I would love to get back in shape. I mean it. Yeah, it's all about quality. You know, people think that oh, I'm going to train with Jeff Finnegan and he's going to train you really hard. I just start really small with him and just get people to enjoy it and, and just let them let them watch themselves improve every day, and, and they love it. I train a lot of people. Just prior to talking to you, I trained a friend of mine, seventy years old, seventy years old, and um, he he loves it. So he's really enjoying it. So I, I love helping people. Well, listen, I, I, I'm certainly a candidate for it. I wouldn't say no, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I can see improvement in myself, you know, uh, you, you know, my weight is right. I'm 180. Ah, you look, pounds. you look healthy. You look great. Well, you know, I feel good. You know, I don't know what it is. My dad died at 103. Yeah, I know. It's That's incredible. Crazy. And yeah, last year at this time, actually. And, um, you know, he he looked like he was about 75. I mean, wow. he looked a lot younger than he was. And, you know, he still had pretty well all his faculties. And uh, so we have good genes in the in the family. You know, most of my dad, my dad was one of 19. And most of his brothers wow. and sisters died 80s and 90s. Wow. Yeah, so. While we're on your dad, what was your relationship like with your father once you left the, the mob? Because he was such a staunch mob guy his whole you know, life. We didn't speak for about 10 years, you know, and, you know, that was a product of him being in prison, me being in prison. We were never out at the same time for a 10-year stretch. And um, But then after 10 years, he sent for me. And I was out in California, so I really want to see you. He was out on parole. I said, okay. And I went to his house at 5.30 in the morning because believe it or not, because we were both on parole, we weren't allowed to see each other without permission. And I didn't want to go through it and he didn't want to go through it. So it was kind of a covert meeting. And I, I, I see him at 5.30 in the morning, I open the door and uh, he looks at me, I'll never forget. We're standing there in the hallway and he said, if you would have listened to me, you'd have been the boss of the Colombo family. <laughs> Just that's his first words to me, right? And I said, dad, are you in like the twilight zone or something? I said, I'm out of that life now. He said, you're really serious. Huh? I said, yes, I'm very serious. He said, all right, let's talk. And that's how we kind of broke the ice. And I said, dad, look, I said, one thing that you don't realize as a result of your involvement, my involvement, our family was destroyed. My mother, 33 years without a husband, um, if you would have saw their relationship at the end of their life, it was ugly. My mm -hmm. mother resented my dad for everything that went wrong in her life. I had a sister died of an overdose of drugs at the age of 27. Wow. My brother, a drug addict, 25 years of his life, he contracted the HIV virus. He became an informant, testified against my father and a couple of other guys. He was a street kid, you know. My younger sister died of an overdose, of, uh, I'm sorry, died of cancer. I, my whole family was destroyed. Mm. I said, I don't want to do that to my family. For what? I said, you didn't. You know, and I told him, I said, you did all of this time. You never opened your mouth. You stood up. And what did the family give you in the end of the day? I'm not saying they owed you anything, but what, what did all of this do for you? It didn't do anything for you. I said, I don't resent anybody. I'm not mad at anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody. I just want to protect my family and, and protect my life. Mm. Hey, Michael. And I, I made that decision. Mike, it's crazy that you say that because I do a lot of public speaking today and I, and I tell the people I talk to, there's one thing, you know, you, people say you don't want to change things. Of course, I'd like to change lots of things that happened to me. But the one thing that you don't realise, like your father, like yourself and like myself, you always think, oh, we're big, we're tough, we're, we, can, we can cope with all this stuff. But we don't realise the pain and the agony that 
that I've put my children through, that I've put my wife through, that I've put my mother and father through. If I could change it all, I'd kill myself not to have done that or to realise what I really put them through, Michael, you know. And to hear you say that, it's so, so true. And I mean, I would think that sometimes I think my, my family should hate me for what I'm putting through. They still love me, you know. And I've, I, I, you know, I've tried to change, but like I said, it's just so... Yeah, as, as males and alpha males, we're so, so stubborn and we just think that we can put up with everything but we don't realise what we put our, our loved ones through. And I'm, I'm just so happy that you said that. No, exactly, man. My mother was destroyed over it. Uh, look, my wife waited for me eight years. Mm. We, we were married um, four months when I went off to prison. Oh, wow. And she was 21 years old, you know, and she had to visit me all over the country and drag my little children around with me, you know, when I got out on parole, we had it with a child dragging the baby around, you know, for the next three years that I spent in prison. And, uh, she stayed with me, but look, it's, it's a heartache for the people that you don't realize what you're putting them through. Mm. And uh, I just said, I'm, I'm not willing to do that, dad. I'm not going to hurt anybody. I'm not mad at anybody. Uh, you know, I understood what the life is all about. Um, and you know, that's the one problem I had with my dad is that he would not take responsibility for any of it. He used to say, it's not my fault. I got framed. I said, I know that, Dad. But you didn't get framed because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. You got framed because we were mobsters. Mm. And I'm not saying it's right to be framed. I don't agree with that at all. Government should play by the rules. They're not criminals. They have to use the arsenal of laws that they have. If you can't convict somebody with the arsenal of laws that they have, then you, then you shouldn't convict anybody. Get them for what they did. I said, but, but as a result of that, Dad, our family was destroyed. And this was your choice, your lifestyle. And we have to take responsibility for that. And he wouldn't. He, until, until my dad passed on, he would not take responsibility. He would blame, you know, the system. He blamed every, my brother for going crazy. He blamed, and I, 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 I was upset with him for that. You know, I really was. I mean, I, for, you know, I forgave him like he yes. forgave me for walking away. But um, he just couldn't bring himself to admit it. Maybe internally he did, but he wouldn't say it, you know, to anyone. Yeah, got it. Got it. Yeah, Michael, this has been amazing. I think, look, you know, um, we want to thank you so much for your time today. And um, uh, look, I've got something that I um, I look forward to doing now. Next time I'm in the States, I promise you I will catch up with you, hopefully with Mike and Tommy or with Tommy. But, um, Mal, I can't thank you enough for your amazing insight today and the time you've given us. And, um, yeah, I think that um, uh, this is going to be um, something that I think that everybody should um, sit down, listen to and tune in because um, what, what you spoke about today was a, an insight into, a, into an amazing person's life. And I can't thank you enough, my friend. Well, I really appreciate it. I feel like we made a connection here. So, you know, I, I really do hope when you get to the States, you come and visit with me. We'll spend time together. I'll certainly tell Mike and Tom that we had a great, you know, session together. And um, Just make sure, you don't, me, just make sure yeah. you don't tell anybody what time I'm coming to see you. I will. I will. No, for keep sure. that a secret. Don't let nobody know the time oh, I'm don't coming. Tell them? Yeah. Oh, okay. I won't. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just joking, mate. Just joking. <laughs> okay. uh, no, nah, I'm just joking. But I can't wait we, to. Yeah. Please tell me when this is going to air because I have friends in Melbourne and, of course, my partner in Sydney. I'd lo he'd love to see this. Love yeah, absolutely. To, uh, to we so, will. Uh, yeah, please let Lisa know or, or myself directly. You know, I'll give you my number and uh, I'd love to stay in touch with you guys. Yeah, M Michael, sit, um, I'll get you to talk to my manager, Paul, here and get your number. So when I'm, when I'm over there with Michael, I'll give you a call and I'll pop in and say hello to you. For sure. And, you know, I'm in Newport Beach. You know, I'm out in Orange County. So, but we'll go anywhere. I go to L.A. all the time. I have stores in L.A., two of them there. So we go back and forth. Look yeah, forward to it, Michael. Awesome. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. Thank, Thank you, you so right much, there. Michael. And don't forget to subscribe, Standing 8, YouTube, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. Yeah.